So here we are with uh, the session that we are gonna be starting to speak about the uh, Department of Children and Families. We have with us tonight, Ted Kenny, who will explain his role. He's a, an attorney and he's in charge of that department of DCF is called. Um, we're here to talk about the role that DCF has in the life of many people. And in particular with people who uh, a lot who are um, medium income, maybe low income people, and they and DCF is often in their lives and in the lives of many of our citizens. Um, this event is Vicki, Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement is sponsoring this. And we want to thank the Association of Africans Living in Vermont for giving us space and the Caroline Fund. And what else? The Attorney General's Office for giving us kindly Ted Kennedy, who's in charge of that department and who will lead our discussion tonight. So with that, I will introduce Ted Kenny again, an mm -hmm. old mm -hmm. colleague of mine, Kenny, mm -hmm. an old colleague of mine, Ted and I have known each other for probably a hundred years, Ken, Ted. Yeah. yeah. And so he, take it away, Ted, and if you'll explain what it is that you do and what you don't do and what you would like to do. Sure. Um, I, I am, uh, my official title is that I am the division chief in the attorney general's office for the uh, human services uh, the Agency of Human Services. The Agency of Human Services is technically therefore our client and my client. I, I don't work for DCF. I, I am one of the lawyers that um, uh, advises them. Um, but even that, I am I'm kind of in charge of the lawyers that do that. And uh, the agency also has a whole swath of state government in it, including corrections, uh, mental health, et cetera. Um, but the, uh, the, the basics of it is that, um, the lawyers that are in the, in this section represent the department for children and families. So, um, I, my background is that I've, I've been a lawyer since 1991. Um, I did not always work for the state. In fact, I only started working for the state in the last year for the first time. Other than that, I've either had my own practice or, uh, been, uh, with other lawyers. When I had my own practice, I was um, I had a, a bunch of different contracts with the mm -hmm. Defender General System, and what that meant is that I would represent people who were accused of crime, adults who were accused of crime in in uh, what's now called the criminal division in adult court, um, but I also had a juvenile defender contract, and what that meant is that DCF or the state's attorney's office. I represented, depending on the luck of the draw, there would be times I would be representing a mother in court, uh, I'd be representing a father, or I'd be representing the children, uh, or mm. you know, just mix and match, I would be on all sides of, of the aisle. Yeah. Um, and Sandy and I actually had a number of cases uh, over the years together where um, sometimes we were on the same side and sometimes we were not. Um, but that, uh, that certainly did uh, give me a, an interesting uh, and I think a very good perspective. Um, the, the name of this um, presentation is the Department for Children and Families, the Influence of DCF in Family Lives of Vermonters. And before I go much further, I'm gonna note that I'm gonna be looking over because I have a couple of different computer screens in front of me in the era of COVID. And uh, over here is where my notes are. So I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to look uh, pensive or wise, I'm reading my notes. <laughs> and if I end up sounding wise, then that's, that's, just, that's just coincidence. Um, Ted, can I interrupt you for one moment? Sure. Because many years ago, prior to you becoming a lawyer, I guess I was the juvenile prosecutor for a while in the state's attorney's office. First, when Bill Sorrell was the head of the state's attorney's office and then with Mark Keller. Um, and it certainly was one of the more important elements, certainly of my life as well. Yeah, it's, it's critically important work, um, no mm -hmm. matter which side of the case you are on or assigned. Um, mm -hmm. The, uh, it's, it's super, there's, I don't think there's anything more uh, important in the law. 
Um, mm -hmm. I suppose, I suppose we could think of examples, but none, none come to mind right. as we sit here. Um, so the influence of DCF in family life. So let me, let me start with uh, defining what DCF is. Uh, DCF does stand for the Department for Children and Families. Um, and those of us who are older will remember that the, the name of the, uh, this part of the government used to be different. It used to be called SRS, right. um, Social and Rehabilitation Services, um, but they changed to DCF, uh, but it's, it's the same thing. Um, it is Vermont's Child Welfare Agency. It, its job, uh, and you know, this is, I, I understand having been a lawyer on all different sides of these cases that there, there will be, uh, uh, that the system is not always perfect. So when I say things like what its job is, I mean, ideally what its job should be. Um, its job is to uh, make sure that children and, and young adults under the age of, well, actually now 19, um, are safe, or that they're safe from abuse, uh, that their basic needs for things like food and clothing and shelter and healthcare are met, and that families are supported in achieving these goals when uh, these things may be in jeopardy or uh, uh, questionable. So that's what DCF's uh, charge under the law is. Um, a little more specifically with, with what DCF does to make that real. Uh, what does it actually do? What are the nuts and bolts of what it does? Well, uh, it, it, a number of things. Um, first thing is it investigates suspected child abuse and neglect cases. And, and by the way, there, there is a swath of what DCF does that I'm not going to get into tonight because it would be a topic for an entirely different um, topic. And that, that actually involves juvenile delinquencies. If, yeah. if young if young people are, are charged with what would be a crime if they were older, then DCF is involved uh, basically with the equivalent of being a probation office. They are in charge of uh, making sure that, um, they, uh, that the children do what they're supposed to do to rehabilitate themselves. Um, but we're, I'm not going to be getting into that because it's, again, it's a, it's a, different, it's a different topic. Um, right. So they investigate suspected child abuse and neglect. They evaluate children's safety needs through these investigations and assessments. Um, if required, they set up services and support parents uh, and what the parents need to keep the children at home and safe. Uh, if that's not possible, then they place children in temporary out of home care if it's necessary to keep the children safe. Um, they work with parents and relatives so the children can return home safely if they are taken out of the home. And then as a last resort, uh, if, if, and this is very last resort, if things go wrong for months at a time, uh, they would find a permanent home for the children who can't return home safely. And I'll get more into that later. Uh, but that's, uh, that's, the, that's, that's the worst case scenario. So essentially, DCF is designed to be a family safety net. It's designed to uh, help people uh, when they're struggling with uh, issues that make the children's lives, uh, make their health or safety in danger, make their psychological or emotional health in danger. Um, DCF is designed to try to come in and uh, be a safety net for for that, and again, um, I I understand having been on all sides of these cases that DCF is run by human beings, and human beings make mistakes. Um, so I I know that I'm in a kind of in an ideal world here, um, but that is that is the ideal that it is by law supposed to try to uh, live up to. So one. One question that this brings up that I wanted to address is uh, the, the scariest one. Um, and that's whether DCF is going to take a child away from a family. Permanently. Well, per um, because there are, there are times when, when that does happen. Mm -hmm. and the children, actually most of the time when a child is taken out of the home, they actually get returned back if everything goes according to plan. And most of the time it actually does. Um, but the answer of will DCF take my child away is that 
DCF is obligated to work with parents on a plan to keep the child uh, at home in the first place. Um, it's, its first instinct is not supposed to be to take children out of the home. Uh, this is something that I've seen you know, since the 1990s where it's kind of a pendulum where it swings back and forth where sometimes DCF is accused of acting too quickly to take children out of the home. And then there are other times, uh, it seems like the pendulum swings back and DCF uh, is in the media because it did not move quickly enough to take right, children. Right. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a continuous, you know, as, as, uh, as my boss TJ Donovan says, uh, quoting his uh, uncle, uh, a, a wonderful former state senator, right. There, there are no final, there are no final battles in politics, and there is no final battle in, in human, uh, uh, human endeavors either. Um, so, it, the first thing they would do is work with parents on a plan. If that plan does not work, or if it cannot work, then DCF would ask a judge to review the case and decide if the child must be removed from the home. Um, so this is one of the most important points here is that, you know, under American law, under Vermont law, parents have an absolute right, a constitutional right wow. mm. to raise their children. And children have a constitutional right to be raised by their parents. But like any right, it can actually be lost if, if they... Uh, the parents can lose that right if they hurt the children or don't give them what they need. Now, again, these cases can get into a gray area, but generally speaking, it's not that people are, children are taken away from parents because the parents don't own a home or they don't have a swing set or something like that. There, there's something much more serious going on in mm. these kinds of things. But um, the, I, I understand from my time in court over the decades that people are very concerned with DCF and whether they are going to uh, jump in and suddenly take, take children away. Um, I will share with people that my, uh, my, my daughters are teenagers now. Um, and when they were, uh, when they were toddlers, when they were babies, um, this kind of thing, being a lawyer and being having done this work myself and seeing things that go on in court, this this fear would enter my head sometimes. Um, I was there, nothing ever, you know, I was never accused of anything. Um, but I realized that, you know, so I'm I'm telling you that so that you realize that it's you know, uh, it's understand. It, I, I understand that this is a real uh, concern in the community, um, but the big thing is that there is a constitutional right to raise your children and DCF has to go to a judge mm -hmm. to, um, to get permission and a court order to uh, take a child out of the home. Um, Can I interrupt and ask a question? What about emergency hearings? Can, can, well, DC, yeah, can DCF based on, for instance, if a neighbor calls, uh, DCF and says that there's abuse going on next door. W do you have to go in front of a judge before you would enter that home or get an order before you even enter the home or yes. not? Do, yeah. Is yes. it ex parte? Yes. Would it, um, yeah. Yes. And that means that the parents are not there in court to argue about it. Um, right. And actually, they're, a, a, most cases do not start that way, but more than enough do where. Yeah. Um, where a situation arises where children are, uh, where information comes to DCF that a child is being very seriously abused or neglected. Um, and in those cases, then an emergency hearing, an emergency petition, which is really just a court filing, which is uh, asking the judge on paper, um, please give us the authority to go get this child. and a report sworn to under oath on, in writing um, supporting that that says this is why um, yeah. it is it is not uh, as, as lawyers say it is not a pro forma thing meaning it's not just well I filled out the paperwork and this is what I get it's not like you you know you put the 
coins in a vending machine and it pops something out. It's not like you go and you put your papers into court and then, you know, you get your order and you can go get your kids. The judges do take it seriously. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying they always get it right either. Um, but judges will read uh, those reports and uh, make a decision uh, based on, on them. And sometimes they say no. Um, sometimes they say, uh, this is not that much of an emergency, even if all of this stuff is true. Mm -hmm. um, so go, you know, hand, hand these papers to these people and we'll have a hearing uh, right away. Now, Sandy, you brought this issue up about what, you know, is it ex parte? It is uh, in terms of going to get the children, but the law is that the um, the court has to have a hearing where the parents are allowed to be at and make their case. Later though, right? Later, usually later that day. Yeah. Um, in in Burlington, it used to be in Chittenden County that they had uh, a fam the family court judge that was doing this uh, these kinds of cases, or as lawyers say, this docket, because we're fancy and we can't just say cases. Mm -hmm. uh, the, a judge that is doing the, that docket um, almost always reserves time between one and one thirty every day. Uh, really? Now, yeah. Left blank. Where if there is an emergency situation, the judge will. Um, that's that's when they will come in and, and deal with it. Um, every day. Usually, yeah. Wow. Um, and and that's you know that's one of the dangers in family court as, as a lawyer is if you if you have a hearing. Uh, scheduled for uh, one thirty in a divorce case in some of the smaller counties, Franklin County uh, or Addison County or Grand Isle, um, and an emergency situation has come on, the clerk is going to tell you, just wait. Judge mm. will be done as soon as the judge is done. And sometimes you can be waiting in the hallway for an hour, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. waiting for you to, you know, because the judge is busy doing these emergencies. Mm -hmm. um, so that they they don't just take your child away and then you never see them again. Uh, they you will be in court if not that day, then the next day. Um, yeah. Also, I don't know if our listener, our audience knows what ex parte means. Maybe you could. Well, say. what that ex parte means that only one side is talking okay. to the judge without the other side being there, and that's extremely unusual it's, mm -hmm. it's there's very special rules for it because the court is set up so that whatever is said to the judge is heard by both parties by everybody mm -hmm. who's a party in the case um, the exceptions to that are emergencies and this would be one of those kinds of emergencies another would be in a divorce case if there was a right. situation like this you, you can do an ex parte case, uh, situation um, I, I had an ex parte case as a private practice attorney where a uh, client's uh, uh, RV Winnebago type thing uh, had been taken by his neighbor and we filed ex parte to have the sheriff show up with one of those big trucks to tow it away. Uh, before he mm. could sell it illegally. And you know, so, I mean, ex parte. Can and it be worked fun. and you yeah. got it. It yeah. did. It did. It was, um, the big question was where they were going to put it. Um, mm -hmm. as the sheriff was saying, I'm not taking it back to the office. Uh, yeah. Um, so that, that, well, I'll get into the court process again uh, in a minute, but um, let me, uh, let me get a little more into detail of, of what DCF will do, why it would open an investigation in the first place. Because again, mm -hmm. most of these cases are, um, don't start with court. They don't start with an emergency. Um, they, they start a little slower than that, mo almost all of them, uh, but not all of them. Uh, DCF will open an investigation if it receives a report that a child has been abandoned has been physically, emotionally, or sexually abused, uh, does not have enough food or clothing or shelter or health care, uh, is at significant risk of being abused or neglected, or was at, is without proper medical care, education, or other necessary things. Um, those, those are the big categories. There are pretty much the sky is the limit. It's, it's you know human nature, and you can't anticipate every every scenario but those 
those are the big reasons generally why a case is opened. Um, DCF has an obligation under Vermont law to investigate every case that comes in. Um, every and, case? Yeah, um, at least at least to look at it, and they and they do. Um, I, I will say I've had I've had divorce cases where um, one of the one of the parents is making so many fake yeah. reports to DCF. The DCF finally says their their investigation of it is we received this, but we know that this person lied. The other parent does because we've investigated it a hundred times, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's that's that. Uh, but they they do have to at least do something. But they usually will do an actual. Uh, investigation. Um, let me let me share with the group what the definition of child abuse is under Vermont law. Uh, and if anybody is taking notes, the the citation of where you can find this is in the Vermont statutes annotated. Those are the laws that the legislature passes. Um, it's in 33 Vermont statutes annotated, section 4912, and it says that abused or neglected child means a child whose physical health, psychological growth and development, or welfare is harmed or is at substantial risk of harm by the acts or omissions of his or her parent or other person responsible for the child's welfare. Mm -hmm. An abused or neglected child also means a child who is sexually abused or at substantial risk of sexual abuse by any person and a child who has died as a result also counts as an abused or neglected child. Um, so a couple things out of that that you should keep in mind. One is that it's not just what, uh, uh, child abuse is not defined in Vermont just by what somebody does. It can also be defined by what a parent does not do that mm -hmm. any, any normal parent would. Um, uh, and so that, that would be something as well. So the, uh, uh, an example that has come up many times, and again, a lot of this stuff is very dark then um, yeah. but it is yeah. it is what it is um uh but uh if if a parent knows that their spouse and let me put the genders in because if it's i've, I've had man. cases where there are, there are women doing this but it, almost always it's men uh who are is sexually abusing a child um and the mother knows that that's going on and isn't doing anything about it then the mother that that is an omission to protect the child that does count as child abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, obviously, the, per, the, the man involved in that scenario would be abusing the child, obviously. Um, but that's, that's the kind of thing as well. Um, it, it's not, though, I want to be clear about this, that it's if, if a child is being physically or sexually abused and the parent is not, uh, and one of the parents is not doing anything to stop it, that parent is very likely not going to get into legal trouble if they come forward to, to protect their child. Um, it's just, I've, I've never seen it um, where a mother goes to the police and says, my, my new boyfriend has been hitting my son for no reason um, uh, and I, I, need, I need help. Uh, they're not gonna, they're not going to throw the woman in jail because she didn't do anything before or something like that. So I, I, I want to dispel that if that's a, a concern that comes to mind. But again, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can I ask a question? Please. Because I've seen cases though, where um, a, a woman uh, is being abused herself by her partner, male usually. And, uh, that is considered also grounds, I think, if she puts up with it, that she could lose her children too. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Um, the th thought is that the children living in that circumstance are being psychologically, uh, mainly psychologically, but also emotionally abused and neglected, mm -hmm. um, that they're being exposed to a violent situation that is harming their development and will basically perpetuate and continue a, a cycle yeah. of, of this kind of activity um, because you know children children learn from example more than anything else um, so yeah that that is true um, it it's not the, the 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 fear that a lot of people have and I've, I've represented a, a 
very large number of uh, women who have been abused. And um, they begin to fear that if they go forward to say anything yeah. about it, right. that they will somehow lose their children. And, and the men who are doing the abusing will say that. Uh, I, one of the last private cases I had was a teacher. Uh, I was actually representing her uh, in a personal injury case where she'd been hurt and we were um, making a claim for the company that was responsible for her being hurt. And I called her about the um, about her case and she sounded very upset and I asked her what was wrong and she had just blurted out that her husband had been abusing her uh, terribly. Um, and she was a teacher and he was a businessman and he had not done anything uh, to leave a bruise, but he had a gun. Uh, a gun? He, he said that he was going to kill her. Uh, he said that he would, um, that if she, if she left him, he would get the best lawyer he could and he would, he would take the baby. And she believed him. Um, and, and it's, it's easy we're, we're off topic here, but let me just finish my thought is that it's, it's easy to think that, that, you know, how could, how could she believe that she is a college educated professional? She was a, a, uh, early education teacher, I think second grade teacher in a rural, uh, part of Vermont. And the answer is that it didn't start out that way. Uh, he didn't, he didn't one day say this because if he had, she would have said, what are you talking about? You've lost mm -hmm. your mind. Mm -hmm. um, it was one little step at a time. Yeah. And uh, it's the analogy. And I actually don't know if this is scientifically true, but uh, a frog boiling in water, that if you drop a frog into boiling water, it'll jump out. Mm -hmm. But if you put a frog in room temperature water and you slowly put the temperature up, it won't jump out because mm -hmm. it'll keep acclimating to it. Um, uh, and so I, I think that that was a textbook example. But you know, she she was not in any trouble uh, herself um, to uh, you know to go to the authorities. And I, I uh, luckily her parents were up visiting, uh, as luck would have it, and uh, the situation was entirely resolved within 24 hours. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they are now divorced. Um, <laughs> right. So Can I just add something real quickly. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, uh, Charlotte Den. I'm a lawyer, but. Um, I just wanted to bring up something that I found terribly shocking. And it was a case I worked on years ago for Kurt Hughes. I was then a paralegal. And these two daughters, uh, these two young women had been ritually abused uh, by their um, stepfather yeah. from the time they were almost infants till they were young teens. And um, it turned out that the mother knew about it and she encouraged it. She told the girls, this is how you're gonna learn about sex. And, and what ultimately happened is the girls finally um, sued and they sued DCF. And uh, uh, DCF was uh, punished with a $10 million fine, if you like. That was a big case, but what shocked me is that apparently this happens. That the, there are a lot of a lot of women, maybe in rural areas, that that have this opinion. You know, this is how you're going to learn about sex. Yep. I wouldn't Every... say that, Charlotte. I really wouldn't say that there are a lot, or that it occurs only in rural areas. If that kind of abuse happens, it certainly is also occurring in cities. I would guess. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Every, uh, when I had the public defender contracts in Franklin and Chittenden County, every case I ever had where a woman was accused of sexually abusing uh, her children, um, she had basically, she was also physically abused by the yeah. man uh, and um, was basically led into it. Um, but it's still not that they're not responsible right. um, at that point, but yeah, um, that case made precedent uh, by in the Vermont Supreme Court that, that Charlotte was just talking about and uh, was a big, uh, a big, a big decision. Um, so, yep. Um, so how does, how would DCF investigate these, uh, a case if they get a report that a, a child is being neglected or abused in a family, 
what do they do? Um, well, the first thing, I don't know, first, but their, their, their instructions are to do the following. And none of these are mandatory, but they're what they are, as the case requires, it's what they are uh, uh, to do. Um, they're to visit the family home if it's safe to do so. Uh, they are to interview the parents or other adults in the home who serve in a parental role to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, by the way, a lot of cases get dismissed, at the, not even though they're not in court. A lot of cases get closed by DCF uh, when, when that happens. A lot don't, but um, it's entirely possible that DCF will look around the house and say, you must have a neighbor who hates you because we got a report that this place is full of garbage, but it's clearly not. See you later. Um, uh, but they will interview the parents and other adults. They'll go to the home. Um, they can, uh, under law, uh, if, if, the if the parent is, um, I guess, the suspect of, of significant abuse or neglect, and this is usually in cases where there is sexual abuse or neglect, uh, then the law allows the DCF workers to uh, speak to the child um, without the parent's permission. Um, it almost always happens at school. Um, and that, that is, the, the DCF has a legal right to do that, and they do uh, do that. Um, and that they don't need any permission, because if they needed permission, then they would be asking the abusive parent, can we talk to the child about you abusing the child? And the abusive parent would say, no, no, you cannot. Um, so they are allowed to do that. Um, and actually, let me let's stop here and just, I want to be clear because these, these cases that, in, that end up in court usually do involve, if they're sexual abuse, it usually involves a, a stepfather, a boyfriend, yeah. uh, uh, or the father. Um, but the vast majority uh, of child sexual abuse is actually uh, older child on younger child. Um, the, the percentages are most. Um, most sexual abuse is a uh, teenager or older teenager on a younger child. Um, it's usually not the biological father, um, but there are more than enough cases where it is. Uh, so and, they all have taken And is it also accurate to, that many stepfathers too? Yeah, um, that's, uh, in fact, I was involved in cases when I had the contracts where um, the stepfather was sexually abusing the stepdaughter but not his own biological daughter yeah. and i yeah anyway um but but again you know i i had a friend who was a um radiation technician i don't know the actual word for it but she she treated people with, who had cancer um, sure uh but uh she she and I were talking once, and um, we both concluded that she thinks everybody has cancer, and I think every child is being abused. Um, and she she told me I was wrong, and I told her she was wrong. It's just that that's what we see all day because that's what we do, and and it's important to keep that in mind. You know, the vast majority of children are not being abused; they're not being neglected. Uh, and you know, when we talk in these terms, it's easy to go dark, as as we say. Uh, you know, have a, a but. Anyway, um, the, when DCF investigates these cases, they, they have a number of factors that they consider. Um, those are things like the child's vulnerability, uh, the caretaker conditions that pose a current danger for the child or threaten the child's immediate safety, um, and the family's capacity to keep the child safe in the immediate future. Um, if the child is not in any immediate danger, um, it's not going to be some sort of emergency thing. In fact, it might not even go to court. Um, I, any number of cases where a, um, a child has been um, abused by somebody who is not a permanent member of the family or a neighbor or something like that. And in those cases, it, it does not go to court. Uh, DCF will provide services. Uh, the parents voluntarily agree uh, to you know, work with DCF and then DCF closes the case and the family goes on without without the government in its life, at least not that part of the government. Um, the, 
so that that brings me up to the next question is, is which i've been speaking of for some time but let me just emphasize does dcf always find a problem when it investigates no it does not um if there is no risk to the child found then dcf will close the case um if the risk is low or moderate uh then dcf will try to work with the family and if everything goes well dcf will close its own case not a case in court but its own case on its own files uh within 60 days or so um that's but they comes knocking does that mean that you're only steps away from losing your children forever no i don't want to underestimate i don't want to undersell how scary that can be or what could happen if there's a serious uh problem uh or or something goes horribly wrong but uh, the vast majority of the time, that that's not the case. So what does DCF do if help is needed? Um, there, there is a process that they follow. Uh, they are to identify the issues uh, the, that the family needs to address. Uh, they have to assess the child's condition, not just the family, but the child specifically. Um, they are to assess the family's capacity to protect the child. We talked about that a moment ago. Um, they are to identify ways the extended family can help. Um, is there an aunt, an uncle, family, friends, grandparents who can uh, assist the family uh, through a, a situation? Um, and identify the services the family might need. Um, those in you know, the last 10 to 15 years, by and large, that is that involves uh, substance abuse um, and mm -hmm. uh, getting parents into uh, uh, drug treatment programs. Um, but that's that's the kind of that'd be an example of of pointing people in a direction so that they can get the help they need, so that they can be uh, good parents. And actually, even that phrase. Let me stop there for a second. Um, the law actually says that parents only need to be adequate right. uh, and that that is uh, i suppose you could look at that from a uh one perspective and say well that's a very low standard but it's it's not adequate means adequate means good enough um and the reason for that standard is that they don't want a judge coming in and saying well the biological parents uh they're adequate but the foster parents, my goodness, they're college educated, they're wealthy, they have a wonderful backyard, they're better. So I'm gonna go with that and give give these people a child. No, um, all, all a parent has to be is adequate. Um, but to get there, uh, DCF will oftentimes recommend individual counseling, family counseling as a, as a group, um, parenting classes to teach parents expectations of, of certain ages that the children are at. Uh, as I'd mentioned, substance abuse treatment for alcohol or drugs, uh, and even job training if, if that's uh, uh, a requirement. So the next question is, when, when would a case go to court? And that's where, that's where most people's uh, focus is in these cases, um, because that's scary. Uh, the answer is it's, it's, it would be a serious situation. Um, if a parent hurts a child, uh, if a parent neglects a child, uh, if a parent does not protect a child from abuse or neglect, um, if the parent is abusing, is using drugs or abusing alcohol, um, or if there's been sexual assault or sexual exploitation, um, uh, the example that was given um, uh, some time ago was exactly right. If, if the children are actually being exploited in the home uh, in a sexual way, then that, that case will go to court. Um, so the next question would be, what is the court process? What would one expect if, if that is going on? Well, if, if, that, if it comes to that, is what I should have said. Um, the, first, the first thing to know is that the, the lawyer that files these is actually the state's attorney, not the attorney general's office. The state's attorney and Sandy was in this uh, job when she was a deputy state's attorney. Um, uh, is is the local prosecutor, and they file what's known as a petition. Um, peti petition just means the allegation. Um, it's the document that is the allegation. Uh, an equivalent in 
uh, a criminal case would be an indictment. It says what what they think you did wrong. Uh, in a civil case, it would be a complaint where a car accident. I'm, the complaint reads that the person went through a red light and hit me and I got a broken arm, something. Um, but this, this in this area of law is called a petition. Um, and they asked the judge in the, in the allegation, they asked the judge to find that the child is a child in need of supervision, C-H-I-N-S, chins. And that's what everybody calls it, chins. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you say chins, uh, people in the area will know, will know what you mean. Um, and these are known as chins proceedings. Um, and the chins paperwork that, that the state's attorney files will give DCF's side of the story. Um, and, uh, you know, again, that, that, that's the first thing that the judge reads. Now, parents, you know, I want to be clear, it's, it's not like all is lost, big brother is there, you are uh, doomed uh, if this ever does happen. Um, parents have a right to their own lawyer. Um, if they can't afford a lawyer, one will be provided for them. That's what I did. Uh, and, and I want to be clear, I took that job very seriously and worked hard for my, my clients. Uh, I don't, well, I, I suppose there are some uh, lawyers that I would say are probably not as good as others as in any profession. But by and large, the lawyers that do this in Vermont take their job very seriously. Um, and they, they, they will be your lawyer, even if you're not paying them. Um, interestingly enough, each parent has a right to their own lawyer. The mother gets a lawyer. The father gets a different lawyer. Uh, the reason for that is because you, you can't tell as the case goes forward, depending on the family dynamics, family circumstances, the, the parents might not be allies. Uh, they might start out as allies and not end that way, or they might not start as allies, but end up a team. Um, but each one gets a right to their own lawyer, even if you don't have money to hire one. Um, you have a right to see the DCF report that gets filed with the judge. Mm. And... The process will allow you to dispute and disagree with DCF side of the story and give your version of events. Um, the, the thing is though, that's not what's going to happen on the first day. It will happen, it will, but not on the first day. The first hearing uh, would be a preliminary hearing where everybody comes to court. If it's been an emergency, then it'll be like I said, sandwiched in and, and scheduled uh, that way. Um, but at a preliminary hearing, and I suppose this sounds a little unfair, but in the scheme of the entire process, it actually works out in, in a balanced way. But uh, at the first hearing, the judge has to presume that the report that DCF has filed is true. They have to take it at, first, at face value. Um, and go with that. Now they don't keep that point of view after that day. Um, they, but in the first, the first thing that they do is they look at it and say, if this report is true, does it rise to the legal definition of child abuse or child neglect? Um, and if it does not, then the judge would dismiss the case right then and there. That almost never happens, um, mm -hmm. but it could. Um, but it's the judge is supposed to review it for is what lawyers say a prima facie case, which means if this is all true, does does it hit all of the ingredients for uh, child abuse, child neglect? Um, the judge will not presume that to be true at later hearings, but at the preliminary hearing, based on what's in that report and having to take it as true. Um, uh, the judge in a serious case where the children, the judge will decide where the children will live until the judge can figure out at a hearing where everybody gets more time to present stuff. Um, the judge will decide where the children are going to live. Um, are they going to go into foster care or are they going to be returned home? But the judge will issue a court order to the parents. Um, you know, do not let Uncle Joe around the children. Um, uh, make sure they go to school. Um, this medicine must be given to the child, uh, you know, whatever the issue is, whatever the situation is. Um, that can happen as well. Um, 
if the children are told are going to be living somewhere else then at that hearing, the judge will almost always come up with a court order for what kind of contact the parents will have with the children um, on you know, what, whether they can see them, how they can see them, phone calls, um, does it have to be a supervised visit, things like that. Um, and then at the, also at the preliminary hearing, the judge will schedule uh, a, another hearing um, that will determine so that the judge can see for herself or himself if this stuff is even true and have witnesses and evidence and things like that. And they'll, they'll put a scheduling order in place uh, for that. Um, the next step of the court process would be actually not taking place in court, um, but that would be where the lawyers who are representing the parents would have a chance to talk to the parents. And this is, this is measured in days and weeks, by the way, this is not like that day. I suppose it could be. Um, but the lawyers will talk to the parents. They will investigate the case, uh, read the reports, um, talk to witnesses, um, even possibly question the DCF worker uh, in, in some kinds of things that are called a deposition where the, you can ask the questions before you even get to court and they're under oath. And it's a little more informal because they're usually recorded and there's, uh, there's no judge. Um, but these, these kinds of things would, again, be measured in, in weeks. Um, another, another thing that might be happening the whole time, depending on the case, is that uh, it's possible that you may try to reach an agreement if you're the parents. You may try to reach an out-of-court, so to say, it'll go back to court, but uh, an agreement uh, between the parties, between DCF and the parents. Um, it could be that the parents will do counseling and then get the children back in the home. Um, uh, if a dangerous person is living in the home, uh, that person would leave and they would get a court order that they're not allowed to come back, a restraining order. Um, all of that is completely up to the parents, though. If the parents don't want to agree, uh, they don't have to. Uh, they, can, they can wait and they can... Uh, present their case to the judge and the judge will listen to their side of the story. Um, I would say though that, that if the lawyer does um, recommend that something works out where you're going to get the, your children back, um, that is something you should very seriously consider. Um, I, yeah. uh, I used to tell my, my clients the, when I had the parents and not the children, I'd say, look, you know, it, it, they, they say that you need to do alcohol counseling. You say you don't have an alcohol problem. Okay, do the counseling, even if you don't have an alcohol problem, and then you'll do really well at it and you'll get your children back. And But if, if you, this is about pride or the principle of the thing, I would trade my pride for my children. Um, and um, a lot of people would do that, but some people would not, and we'd have a contested hearing. Um, um uh, Ted, before, um, is, uh, I'm wondering if anybody has any questions because we're approaching seven o'clock. I don't know what your schedule is, but um, maybe, maybe, maybe people do have some questions. I don't know that. But maybe if they do, that's ask. fine. I probably have another five minutes on what I'm. Okay, saying. go ahead. I got, yeah. I got time. Um, mm -hmm. um, in the court process, the next thing would be if, if it doesn't get resolved, it would be a merits hearing. And that's basically the same as a trial in these kinds of cases. Each side, DCF and each parent, would get a chance to tell their side of the story. Each side's lawyer would get a chance to question the witnesses uh, that come to court. Everybody would be, get a chance to introduce evidence um, under the rules of evidence, but have a chance to do that. It is a formal process. It really is you know, court, right. um, real judge. Um, if the judge decides that DCF was right, that the child was abused or neglected, then the judge will, will say so, either say so that day, uh, which is not most of the time. Most of the time, judge will say, I'm going to take this under advisement. And they go back and they think about it. And then he or she will write, you know, type uh, uh, what they found to be the facts and what they concluded from that. Um, if the judge decides to DC, and so then if that does happen, the judge would schedule a disposition hearing, which is the now what do we do part. Um, if the judge decides that DCF was wrong, 
then the case is dismissed and nothing else happens. Um, either side can appeal to the Vermont Supreme Court. The Vermont Supreme Court will hear the case. The Vermont Supreme Court will only listen to cases for um, legal mistakes. It will not okay. It will not decide who was telling the truth, except, except in extreme circumstances. It will usually decide whether the judge made a mistake in introducing certain kinds of evidence. Did a judge misunderstand a rule and get something wrong about that? But it won't, it's not a do-over uh, in front of the Supreme Court. Um, if, if there is the next stage, because the judge said that found that DCF was right, then the disposition, a disposition report is written by DCF. Um, the disposition report is to the judge and everybody gets a copy of it. Uh, it's supposed to be three days before a hearing, so you have time to read it and think about it. Um, and that'll tell the judge what, what DCF thinks happened and what DCF thinks should happen next. It almost always, almost always includes steps that the parents will take uh, to become better parents, to make sure the children are not abused or neglected, and basically to either get the children back or if the children have been in the house the whole time, which is possible, uh, which happens a good chunk of the time, um, just to get DCF out of their life. Um, you consider it to me like a roadmap, uh, that if you do these following things and do them adequately, then you, know, you will get the children back and DCF will be out of your life. Um, to come up with that plan, DCF will have talked to the parents, witnesses, family members, professionals, people like that. Um, Parents can disagree with the plan, uh, either all of it or a part of it. Um, say, I, I agree with, uh, you know, that I need to go to alcohol counseling, but I really don't have an anger problem. I, I had that one time where I yelled, but, and the judge might say, yeah, you're right. You don't have to do that. Um, if a disposition plan is put in place, uh, it really should be followed. Um, Disposition plans happen a lot where the children are still living in the home or they're being transitioned back to the home. Um, so uh, it's important to follow that if the, you know, again, just in a, in a brutal nuts and bolts way, if you want your children back and you want DCF out of your life, um, follow the plan. Um, if the disposition plan is not followed uh, in a serious way, and uh, parents, you know, if there's, uh, you know, serious abuse, serious neglect, serious mental health issues that are not being addressed or anything like that, and it goes on for long enough, then DCF can go back to ask the judge to terminate parental rights. And right. the parents right. will no longer be the parents ever. It's, it's a death penalty for parenting, basically. Uh, that involves a huge new case, more right. huge hearings, uh, more witnesses, more evidence. Um, they're, they're big deals. Um, if the judge agrees with DCF at that, then the children would no longer belong to the parents. The parents would not be the parents of those children anymore. That can also be appealed to the Vermont Supreme Court. Um, I, I bring that up so that I, I flesh out the entire spectrum, uh, but do keep in mind that that, that is rare. Um, the vast majority of D DCF cases do not end in a termination of uh, parental rights. So to wrap up, let me, let me just emphasize um, that people, whether you are a citizen, whether you are not a citizen, you have a protected constitutional right to raise your children as you see fit. But that right is not total. It is not absolute. You are not a king or a queen. Um, DCF can ask you, or if they if that doesn't work, they can ask a judge. Uh, they can ask you to do things if your children are in danger to make yourself a better parent or to make sure the children are not in danger or harm. Um, and if the case does go to court, parents have a right to a lawyer and a right to tell their side of the story to the judge all throughout the case. Um, so it's not, and again, I, I, I know that there is oftentimes uh, fear in the communities. Sometimes, sometimes that fear is justified. I have to say, uh, sometimes DCF is staffed by people who are being human beings, reach the wrong conclusion. Um, but there is a system in place that will that will if if you if you do the system, um, 
the odds are that this will not end in a nightmare and that everything will, you know, you'll, your life will go back to normal. There are no promises, but that is, that is generally how these cases actually do end. So I, uh, that, uh, is my, uh, that is my case. That's my conclusion. Thanks. Thank you, Ted. Um, really, thank you a lot. That was a very good presentation. Um, but I do have a question out of something that I heard recently. Um, first of all, the mission of DCF is to um, reunify families, right? Yes. I mean, that is the mission that the biological family or the adoptive family should be unified. And that's in the best interest of the kids. Right. 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 And one of the ways that DCF does this is by visitation with the parent. Although the kid might be in a foster situation, might be in the custody of DCF. However, in general, visitation is allowed with the, with the uh, biological or adoptive family, right? Yes, right. Well, I heard recently that because of COVID, those visits had been shut off. Is that true? No, um, but there is some truth to that. Um, because of the uh, uptick in infections uh, and because parents who, because children who are in state custody are not in the same pod family uh, mm -hmm. as their biological right. parents, um, then that does pose a greater risk of infection. So the, um, the department is asking parents to voluntarily change to video visits uh, for the next I don't even know how long, honestly. Um, it depends on the science, I guess. Um, but yeah, that that is true. If that if that can't be worked out, then it really depends on the circumstances. Um, uh, one uh, one example would be if uh, if the parents are generally if if everybody involved, the foster parents, uh, the social worker, the the parents themselves are not uh, in a, a class of people that would find COVID extremely difficult to deal with, or if somebody in their family uh, isn't in that. So somebody is not immunosuppressed or has an underlying condition that would be very hard for them to survive COVID. Um, if that's the case, then there's it, it's likely if it, that those face-to-face -face visits are going to continue on, provided, which right now, everybody is supposed to be wearing a mask anyway. Um, but provided that that mask is actually in place. It's still a very fluid uh, policy. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, but if, if there mm -hmm. is a situation where, um, uh, where a, say a foster family has a child who is struggling with cancer treatments and is immunosuppressed, then the, um, the department, either probably through the state's attorney's office, that's, where, that's who handles most of these cases, um, would ask, uh, would go to, um, uh, uh, would go to the judge and the department would be asking the judge to make the visits video visits. Um, the judge might say no. Um, DCF does not have the power by itself to decree an order that all visits are going to be suspended. Um, these visits are in place because they are a court order and then you get into right. separate powers. The um, the DCF is part of the executive branch, um, and uh, they have to obey court orders like everybody else, and the judicial branch is separate, and the judicial branch is the one that said, this is an order, do it. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if DCF just shuts off the visits, then they would be violating a court order. There, there are extreme circumstances, though, Sandy, where DCF does have the authority to um, stop a visit if there is a uh, risk of harm to a child. Um, that's true all the time. Um, so if the child that's in foster care is, you know, immunosuppressed, they're not going to say, well, go to the visit anyway, and let's just hope you end up okay while we wait for the court to decide. But that, that's extremely rare, and that would be an emergency hearing, and, you know, everybody would try to get in as fast as possible. But, um, but I, know, I know there's been some confusion about that, and I, I can't get much more into it, but there's been... Uh, yeah. There's been a lot of work behind the scenes on that. Right, right. That's how I happen to hear about it is behind the scenes. But thank you for clarifying that. I think Barry has a question, right, Barry? I guess he's not there, right? I think in the chat there might be. Okay, in the chat, yeah. 
two questions. When the complaint is sworn to, uh, who's it sworn to by whom? Um, generally the DCF investigator. Yeah. Uh, it'd be the investigator that is reporting what other people are saying. Um, on personal knowledge or information and belief, the answer is both. Um, if the if the DC it's the author of the report that would be swearing to it, and the author, if they have firsthand information, would put that in the report. Uh, otherwise, they would be relaying what other people told them, and that would be on information and belief. Um, the um, uh, that's that's the same in pretty much everything. I mean, a criminal case starts in Vermont where a police report comes in. Yes. Police almost never actually see a crime happening. They respond after the crime occurred and they talk to the victim or they talk to witnesses and then they report what they said and that, present that to the court. Um, uh, but it's, it's basically the same thing. Um, have independent studies been done to determine the level of class, racial, religious bias on the part of investigators, judges, et cetera? Um, I, I don't know, but I have to assume that they have been. Um, I, I will tell you that the um, uh, that is a big that is a big issue in the attorney general's office. Um, we have uh, uh, TJ Donovan actually had a 21-day um, uh, course that we took uh, about an hour, uh, an hour a day uh, this summer on um, implicit bias and prejudice and that that thing, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, levels of, uh, have there been re uh, investigations and studies on this? I have to imagine there have been. Um, I have to imagine that that is part of the system. Uh, implicit bias is uh, everywhere. Um, I will say I'm, I'm sure I am, I, I would know that I am guilty of that too. Uh, and uh, I think that's the first step. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's, if if the if the follow up question to that would be um, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth but um, is there class and racial and religious bias in the system? It's got to be, it's got to be, um, and that's that's a problem that we need to uh, need to keep working on. I have a question, uh, Charlotte. Charlotte. Yeah, um, on the question of foster families, uh, is it true that foster uh, that the law has really not uh, cut up with the rights of foster families. Uh, well, it depends. Foster foster families are not uh, parties to a right. uh, Chin's case. Um, right. When I had the contract, they weren't even allowed in the room. Uh, that at least has changed. Um, they they are allowed to come in and uh, uh, observe, and they are heard. The judge the judge will let them speak in certain kinds of hearings, um, but, um, but they, they are not party status. Uh, they, um, they don't have the right to file motions or argue the case or call witnesses. Um, so, so in a way, I, isn't that unfair? I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, my husband and I fostered a child and um, the child had very difficult emotional situation. And just because the child acted up when a, a DCF person visited and ran and got knives and was throwing them around, but it was not against us, it was against DCF, they removed the child from our home and we had no recourse, none whatsoever. It was very painful. This little kid did not want to get thrown in yet another house by DCF. And 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 there you get the whole uh, problem of uh, litigation. I mean, I'm sure they interpreted the event as uh, the child was endangered because he was grabbing knives. But you see, that's one thing I learned that foster families you know, they go through a lot as well and they have very little legal recourse. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I haven't looked at the law in uh, on that area in a number of years, but my understanding is that that would still be the case, uh, that um, the foster parents would not have a legal remedy. They couldn't go to court on something. And, and, and that that's really not a good thing, wouldn't you say? I mean, foster families take on a lot. 
Sure, uh, they, they do. Um, you know, the right response to that, the right legal response to that, I, I hate to say it, but the, it's actually just the way the system is set up, that's something that the legislature would have to um, address. Uh, to me, it's in the same category as uh, de facto parents. Yes. Uh, right. the, Supreme, the Supreme Court, in at least three cases that I know of, uh, ruled that the person who was the, the domestic partner of the biological parent, so the boyfriend or the girlfriend or whoever, um, that when that relationship broke up, the, the, foster, the boyfriend had been dad for nine years and the child is nine and no rights, no yeah. rights. Um, and the Supreme Court said in three different cases, um, until the legislature speaks on this, uh, this is the way it is. It's not our job. We interpret the law. The law is set by the legislature. If we did something on this, it would be, we would be the legislature and we're not. Um, and the legislature finally did move on that and finally did uh, create a de facto parenting uh, statute um, that is uh, that has been used. Uh, actually, the but most recent, bit, most recent a Supreme Court. What's that, it's, Sam? It's very uncertain about that. It's uncertain about what rights people have with children simply by being with with a biological parent, for instance. If that, it, you it know, is. it doesn't, I mean, it could be harmful to a kid to give rights to that kind of a person also. But in the case yeah. of foster parents, they're hired also by the state. Basically, they're paid by the state. Isn't that true? And I don't know if there would ever be a time when they would really have legal rights to a kid. Uh, I mean, I yeah, I think, I think you're right. And I think, uh, well, as it stands now, um, the yeah. legislature yeah. could always change that. Um, yeah, right. Are there other questions? Because I do have one, but I don't want to interrupt anybody else. Anybody else have a question? Because I wanted to know something about cultural differences. I've had people come to see me who are not uh, were not born and raised in the United States, and and for instance, thought that DCF had been intrusive because they had spanked their kids, or worse, I mean, seriously spanked the kid, and basically thought that they, in their own countries, had that right. And of course, it used to be in the United States that you could also spank your kids and not get into any trouble about it. But do you see any problems with cultural differences, Ted, and the involvement of DCF? Well, I, you know, it, the statement I would, the answer I'd give would be probably unsatisfactory because it's going to be a blanket statement. But the answer is yes. Um, I, I think that's got to be true. Uh, anytime human beings are involved and one person's from one culture and another person right. from another culture. But um, I, you know, I, I, I am not, I am not a social worker and I don't actually work for the department. I'm the lawyer who supervises the lawyers who work for the department and have done these cases for years, but I don't, uh, I don't know what kind of cultural training DCF has. Um, I do know that, that I, you know, that I, I did, there is bias in, in uh, about other cultures in, in the people who are in the system from when I was doing these cases in the 90s. I had a guardian ad litem once who um, uh, was an elderly gentleman. Uh, I did, did not like him. <laughs> uh, and he, uh, he made a statement once that uh, these two men of, uh, uh, they were from, they were, they were Arabic. Uh, I don't remember which specific country they were from, but one of them was accused of sexually abusing a child. And uh, he, he said that he thought that that might be because of the, the Arabic culture. Uh, mm -hmm. It was crazy. It was just insane. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I told him so. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it, on, on the other hand, though, you know, the, the, the culture of that, by that example, the culture of spanking, um, yeah. that, that's changed in the United States. That's changed I know, I know. since I was a kid. I know. I know when we grew up, when I grew up, it was quite all right to spank. I mean, it would never have been even questioned. I don't know what a, other people's experiences with that, but that's a really, I mean, yeah. I remember being, you know, that we were kind of hit at, on occasion in the public schools, you know, your yeah. knuckles were wrapped and stuff like that. And it wasn't illegal. It was acceptable, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions, anyway? Yeah, I've got a follow-up to uh, Charlotte's question. Um, in that situation, what would the role 
the well, let me get something straight. I believe you said that the child has an attorney, right? Yes. Okay. Well, if the child has an attorney, shouldn't the attorney be looking into whether it's in the child's best interest to have been taken away from uh, a foster home for the reasons that were stated, and maybe get in touch with Charlotte or whoever, and you know ha be able to call her as a witness. Uh, sure, you know I, I, that that would involve getting deep into the um, yeah. disposition, uh, or you know the, well probably would be at the disposition phase phase. Um, and that that would require, you know, probably an emergency motion or some kind of motion by the child's attorney. Um, I, I, I don't know the, the chances of success of such a thing, but uh, would would a child's attorney be able to um, make that move? Honestly, I don't know. It sounds like they probably would. Um, but uh, I, I actually I don't I don't know the legal answer to that. I, I do know as as a lawyer and Barry, you're you're an attorney that um, my, uh, my thought on this, these back in the day was, uh, give it a try. <laughs> um, it might not work, uh, but, um, see what happens. Um, anybody else have a thought? Um, but it is getting late and I do have one final question. Um, I have heard often that, uh, children themselves, if they've been abused or neglected, nevertheless always want to be with their biological family and that it is the sense of the law i think that the biological or adoptive family is in the best interest of the children and that that is a real mission is it or not ted to reunify those families yes because it is assumed it's in the best interest of the child that that is the presumption uh, the legal presumption that, that actually means something, not just presumption like, well, I right. presume uh, that that's that's the that's the direction that the court is pointed in at the beginning of the case. Um, the cases, Vermont Supreme Court has said point blank that, you know, as I said, not only is there a constitutional right for parents to raise their children, but the children have a constitutional right to be raised by their parents um, and to overcome that constitutional right. Uh, it's, it's the highest legal standard in civil law. It's clear and convincing evidence uh, that, that it's just something that would be in the best interest ever. Um, so that being said, it, uh, that, that is how this, that's where it is supposed to go. Um, that, you know, the, the system is, is pointed in that direction at the beginning of it. That's okay. on paper. <laughs> Great, thank you. It, and it actually generally is. Yes. That's great. Thank you very much, Ted. Any final thoughts or questions before we close for the day? Any of you guys up there? Thank okay, you. Well, thank, thank, thank you. you. That was great. That sure. was really good. Thank you very much. Thanks My a lot. Pleasure. Sandy, it was so good to see you again. Yeah, right. Me too, when, Ted. When this COVID exactly hoax is same. over, we should get some coffee. Yes, right. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you.